just like any other youngsters, being incorrigible, getting in trouble, being out of the youth detention centers and what have you, uh, in, in that context, and growing up in that environment. Uh, you know, my mom, she was legally blind, uh, and we came to California in 1951, but she had some sight, but she was legally blind. And so she was able to get a, a job working at these concession stands that they had then for the handicapped who had state buildings and uh, city buildings. And she got a job working at the juvenile hall in the, in the cafeteria where the probation officers and the mothers and family of loved ones who were youngsters who were locked up would come and eat. And so she knew a lot of people in the community because she would always, if they had no money, she would give money, she'd feed them and those kinds of things when they came through. And so that's how I began to know a lot of the folks and living in uh, Fillmore District, which was a, a, a really uh, had a high uh, concentration of Black folks who lived in San Francisco then. Now you only have 3% or less. Then you had about 18% at that time. And so, you, you know, so, so it's a whole different world. And growing up in that, in that environment, uh, you know, with the youngsters on the street and seeing how they would profile when brothers would stand out in front of the stores. And they had these cops who on this beat would always come by and they will see them coming and they would start walking down the street. Because if they stopped them in front of the store and they'd happen to have no ID on them or they didn't have any money on them, they'd bust them for Vegas. You see, so they were always, you know, there's profiling still going on in that sense. As a youngster um, at 13 years old, the first time I got arrested was shooting dice with the older guys uh, in San Francisco. And uh, then around, I think it was about the eighth grade round in that time, had to wear a uh, dog tag uh, because they had a curfew in, the, in our neighborhood during that time. And, and we had to wear a dog tag with our name, the age on it. They could catch us out after curfew, which was, I think, seven, eight o'clock. They would try to take us to juvenile. But they usually couldn't catch a whole lot of us then, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah. are you telling me that, so you got in trouble as a juvenile, and your mom worked at the facility? Yes, yes. While yes. you were locked up? Yes, I was in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say, do you yeah. hear that? <laughs> uh, that's where I went. That's where I went. Uh, that's where I went. Uh, Hugo Pinnell. So, uh, Brothers of San Quentin Six. It was young. So we used to run together. Yeah, first time we met was when he was, we was a juvenile. He was right across the hall from me. And I asked him, and I he was talking through the window, and I asked him, <clears throat> Some questions where he was from, what he was doing, and he said Nicaragua, and I thought he had said nigga. And when I went opening it, I said, "Brother, what you say?" He said Nicaragua. <laughs> yeah. And we were in we were in Log Cabin Ranch, the county thing. That's the first place it was at. And me and another couple, whole lot of other brothers I knew, and that's he took off. He said, "Well, I'm 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 leaving," you know, and he he took off. We said, "Okay, we you know we kind of guided him, but we we." We didn't, we was gonna do our time, just go head on, you know. And so thereafter, yeah, yeah. Everybody in the Fillmore knew him. We, we used to shoot at the pool hall when when the Giants came out. Willie Mays would come to town and always shoot pool in the black neighborhood, black pool hall where we hung out at. Yeah. And Hugo was a master. He she pooled with him all the time. Yeah. Hmm. And whatever. Back in the day, I had asthma as a kid. Uh, I was born in 1943, so when I came in 1951, I was about seven eight years old. The doctor thought the weather would be better. And my mother had a sister who lived here in San Francisco. So she contacted her when we came. She also had an extended family sister who lived here. And so when we came, the first day we stayed with the extended family, then we moved to the housing projects out there in, in the Double Rock and was before Hunters Point, uh, up down the hill from Hunters Point. And that's where it's in the public housing. Yeah. Where was your family from before in Michigan? My mom was, uh, uh, was a single family person, and uh, she was from uh, 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 Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, okay. Yeah, and I took my first trip there with my auntie in about 2000, uh, I mean, what, 1954, 55. Uh, we caught the Greyhound bus. You know how you pick the chicken and all the food, you take on the bus, get off the bus in uh, Oklahoma City. She takes my hand and she says, son, when we get in there, she said, we can't use the bathroom out here. And we had to go sit in here. And we had a little cubby hole in Oklahoma City in, in the uh, area where you, if you Negro venting, quote unquote, in the context of the, uh, you had to stay in there. And, and that was 
my first uh, really going to the South. Yeah, was with my with my auntie then, and I and I remember going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and she, one of the original glow trials. She used to do the uniforms for me. Oh, and she came awesome. out of the house and she would wash these uniforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first first the only time that I stayed with Oklahoma was was doing that time. And my mom, she didn't know our age. She was born in the river when they went fishing. So she didn't know her age. No way. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, my, she tried to play. She was younger than what she was. <laughs> and my auntie, it was, it was, I would ask my auntie, she said, oh, no, she's young blood. She would never tell me. And <laughs> she had a cousin who knew her age. I come to find out who came up here. And she said, what's she doing up here? Because <laughs> she knew her age. <laughs> And she, <laughs> and she said, your mama may look younger than what she is, but she, she, I said, older than me. <laughs> and there used to be the, um, in the kitchen. And when the, my auntie's house was the house where all the family would come from up and down Fresno, California, all over there. Fresno, California, then across the street where we had extended family, they were still picking cotton in the 50s. Had a cotton field right across the street. And had an outhouse. They didn't have no bathroom in the house. It was in the outhouse when we go down to the Fresno, doing that in Dallas Palace, all those small town in between here and LA. Yeah, yeah, during that time. And Hank Jones was the brother of the San Francisco Eight. Well, I knew him before the uh, the uh, Panthers. We used to because you know this is a period in a lot of rebellions, young blacks being murdered, you're always being justified, trying to figure out what to do. And we're coming together as a group of brothers and sisters who are trying to figure out how we could fit in, not knowing of the Panthers then. No one knew them, of them. At that time, at least the Black Panther Party, Hugh and Newton and Bobby Steele formed together, called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was the original name. Then it changed to the Black Panther Party. Uh, and I can talk about that as well. But uh, we used to come together, and it was during the Black Arts Movement during that period when Emory Baraka and they were coming out to, to the Bay Area. I had gotten involved with the, his name was Leroy Jones, also known as Leroy Jones, got involved with the Black Arts Movement and That's was Amiri involved with Baraka. That. Yeah, Emory Baraka, then known as Leroy, also Leroy Jones, yes. His name, his name, his name Leroy. <laughs> yeah, Leroy, that's right. <laughs> when I said it's the City College, I went to 1964, 65, okay. 63, 64, back and forth, I was in and out. And when I went to uh, City College in San Francisco, was about a uh, 20 minute drive from San Francisco State, which is known as the second, uh, first or second Black Student Union in the United States by the name Black Student Union. But the Soul School the Advisory Committee and stuff over in Oakland started prior to that. So it could have been in that context of a Black Studies uh, 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 organization, it could have been the, the first, you know. But it was called Soul School. Students Advisory Committee, I believe, yeah. But uh, yeah, but so I, I, I met Hugh and, and them when I was uh, in the Black Arts Movement. And when I started the City College of San Francisco um, during that time, they were trying to uh, change the name of the colonial name of Negro Student Union to the Black Student Union. And there was a brother there named Roland Young who was a DJ on the radio station, jazz station who was out there and he was coordinating all the activity. And I got involved with him. And uh, we, was, uh, we had achieved the same, but we had a lot of resistance from the uh, structure, institution. And at the same time, there was a lot of cultural activity that was just going at San, at San Francisco State. So I used to go out there all the time. I went out there so much that people used to say Emory Douglas went to San Francisco State and I'd have to correct him in the article. Now I'm not going to City College, but I was out there so much, you know hanging out because that's where everything went on. And that was how I connected with Emory Baraka and when he had came out here and doing the Black Arts Movement and Hank Jones. And so uh, to make a story short, how I got in touch with you and them was that they knew of my Hank Jones, who I was one of the brothers who was a member of the San Francisco Eight, the brothers who were tortured in, in, down in New Orleans. Had, we were working together and he contacted me and said that they're calling this meeting and they wanted me to do the poster for it to bring Sister Betty Shabazz to the Bay Area. I went to the meeting. I agreed to do the poster. They, it was a very simple poster of Malcolm that they wanted to do for that for the thing. And that was the organization who was putting that on was the Black Panther Party of Northern California, 
which it, all these are coming up from the South during that time. You understand? The whole movement comes from Lyons County during that period uh, and what have you. And so what happened is that uh, they said some brothers would be coming over to the next meeting. And they would agree if they were going to do the security or not. And that was Huey and Bobby when they came over, and little Bobby Hutton and a few others. And at that meeting, they agreed that they will, would do the security. It was after that meeting, I asked them, how could I join? Oh. And they had business cards. You know, they had, they had no, uh, they gave a business card, you and Bobby. And, and I didn't have a card in, so I used to catch the bus. I made arrangements to go by Huey's house, and I catch the bus over to Huey's house. And uh, when I go by his house, he would cook, took me around, introduce me to people in the neighborhood where he lived at, and then we go by Bobby's house. That was late January of 1969, or in February of 1960, no, 68, I'm, excuse me, 1967. Seven, about, okay. Yeah, about three and a half months after its inception, you see. Yeah, and so that, for that, for that, from that phase up until 19, uh, maybe Jack, April, of 1960, we hang around organizing in the neighborhoods. Still a small group, just that small group. And, and you know, at least 15, 16, 17 years old. I'm, I'm maybe old, uh, kind of a mid, mid elder at 21. You know, <laughs> elder, elder, big man Howard was the old man in the party because he was about 28, 30. Him and Bobby, they, they had been recruiting the elders. And how they recruited the elders was through when. You had the uh, thing for event for Sister Betty Shabazz. They had sent a letter to the committee and she wasn't responding. So I think Marvin X, who was a poet, well-known poet, and others knew Eldridge and said there's a brother who just got out of prison who may write, who was a follower of Malcolm in prison and could write the letter on for us and maybe she would come. And they said, we're going to go, we're going to go up to his house. And so I was along with the group that went up to his, up to where he was standing at his lawyer's house. That was Elder Cleveland. When they asked him, he wrote the letter because he was the follower of Malcolm in prison. That's when she agreed to come. And so when she come, the, and then that's when, uh, how they hooked up, they knew of Elders as a writer. And this is a conversation that goes on later on. But they never knew how to get in touch with him. It just happened to came together like that. Because what happened when they went to the airport, San Francisco airport, to escort or off the plane, and you don't see this footage anymore. They went out on the plane <laughs> with the guy and escorting her when she came down off the plane. I just ask you one question. Could I just ask you one question? Uh, why, why were the men who were with uh, Malcolm X's widow armed? For her, for her protection. For her protection? I, did you uh, feel that somebody was going to try to assassinate her? Maybe her life? Do you think her life was in danger? We don't feel that her life is in danger any more than any other black person's life is in danger in America. These Black Panthers showed up some weeks ago at the, at the airport to, beat, uh, to meet the uh, Betty Chavez, the widow of, uh, of Malcolm X, carrying the same things. And the only thing we could, we could find to book them on then, and we couldn't book them, was uh, if they had a live round in the breach and they were transporting guns around in automobiles. After that, she wanted to go straight to where Elder Cleaver was because she knew he was a follower of Malcolm. He worked for Ramparts magazine so-called liberal magazine then that was in North Beach, California, North Beach, San Francisco. And she wanted to meet him. And that's how they all come together. They after what Elgin Hugh and the were able to make that connection because they had a vision about the paper. But they and they knew of him as a writer, but they had no way of contact. So it just came together like that. And so it was there after they made that link together. Then they started to, uh, you know, coming back and forth, cutting it up with him, because then he was, we started a place at the, uh, where we were communicating and coming together at the Black House, uh, and elders lived upstairs, and the culture stuff went downstairs. 
Victorian house. They were always coming back and forth, pick, going upstairs, him, little Bobby and them, and to connect with him and to pick his mind, I guess, on stuff during that time. Yeah. And he eventually got him to, he could, he, because he was on parole. He couldn't be around, he would have been in violation of his, of his, 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 of his parole, being around the Patrick. But Rampart's magazine, because they were a progressive magazine, allowed him to cover the Panthers as a reporter. Therefore, he was not in violation of his parole by right. hanging around, yeah, during that time. Yeah. When I came into the party, they knew I had, had art skills because I had been hanging around. At the Black House, when they were first doing the first paper, it just happened, I came by there one day. And Huey and Elgin were sitting at a table downstairs with, and, and, and talking with Elgin. And nothing was, no color, nothing was taking place downstairs. And I seen Bobby, this is in April of 1967. And I seen Bobby working on that first issue of the uh, Black Panther, which was a legal size sheet of paper. And it had been typed on a typewriter. And he was doing the marker, a uh, headline of it. And I seen it and I told him that I could help him improve it because I still had materials from City College when I took a graphic arts, commercial art. So I went home and came back and it took me about half an hour to come back and forth. When I got back, he said, well, we finished with this, but you, you seem to be committed because you've been hanging around. This, we, this is about four or five months in my hanging around at this time, all, all the time, day in and day out and all that. And so what happened is that uh, they said, well, we're going to start the paper. And say you will be and you and you will be the revolutionary artist. Then you eventually you become the minister of culture. And the paper will tell our story from our perspective. It'd be like a double S war, praise you on one side, criticize you on the other. And they had talked about how they wanted to have artwork and big photographs and captions. So that those who weren't uh, reading in the community, who learned through observation participation to get the gist of the story, just from seeing the artwork, seeing the photographs, and seeing the headlines. And that same thing for seniors and what have you. Yeah. So that's, that became, that's how the whole, and that's how Revolution Artists was the initial title, then became, then became the Minister of Culture. And they got elders committed to working on the paper. They were always coming over because he was working out his studio apartment. Initially, after he left from his lawyer's where he was standing at his lawyer's house, he had in his own studio apartment. And when it's time to work on the paper, I lived down the street from where he lived at then. And I and this so have that made it, I can walk right up when it's time to work on the paper. Hugh and it was still picking his brain about different stuff and what have you. There was now there was also differences that went on, but they were always picking his brain about stuff and what have you. And so what happened is that uh, they used to come, sometimes they would come out from being out from doing the patrols, uh, which sometimes I did myself. I also went out on patrols with them. But they were, most of the time when I started focusing on the paper, after they had went on the patrol, Hugh and Bobby would always come over in the evening, little Bobby Hutton, uh, some of the Forte brothers, the uh, first quadre would come over. And they would always talk about what they did that day. And they always talk about the swine and the pig and how they had confrontation or something went down out there in the community with the pig. And so one evening, Hillary just brought this clip art of a pig on, four, on a hook, which is an actual pig. And he said, we want to put this in the paper and we're going to put the badge number on it or next to it to identify who it is. So each week, the people know who the pig is to harass it and violating their rights and our rights to the community. And so uh, I did that first, cleaned it up, put it in the paper for a couple of times. And it was there after I said, it came to me, why am I not standing up on two hoofs? Why don't I keep the snort and put the bell, belt around it and the flies and you know, the whole thing. And that became that kind of thing. No, yeah. So, so it, they were already calling the cops the pigs. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and understanding that this language was used in the 1800s for a pig. A really? woman brought me a book. Yeah, they showed me a book from the 1800s, but the style of it was not a style. You know, I think the style that I, I ever did was something that the community could identify because they think they could do it themselves. It wasn't that elaborate in in the artwork itself. You know, yeah, and just you know, and then it, you know uh, the, the the courage that was being shown, going out there in the patrols and 
enlightening and educating at the same time. Yeah. So it took on a life of its own. Yeah. I mean, it transcended different class outlooks and thinking. Yeah. Well, you got, you, you call a pig in some of uh, Midwest states, you get a misdemeanor. You go to jail. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you even had the San Francisco Police Department and the Oakland Police Department had a football game called the Pig Bowl, <laughs> trying to change the image of it each year. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> they had it for a couple of years. Huey got arrested in October when he got, when he got shot. It. Yeah, me, uh, me and David oh. Head, we had been running around organized for a couple of weeks with Huey. Bobby had a crew. Huey had a crew, and me and David was he was running with 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 Huey, and it just so happens that I was still transitioning into the party from working, and I had to work at the YMCA that week in, but I, I hadn't mentioned it, and it just so happens that David Head mentioned that he was tired, got Huey and running around. We were going to set every day, seven days a week, up and every day, all day long. We we're out in the hood, organizing, talking to people, what have you, and. Got and so we both say we're tired, and I had to work at the Y, and David was tired. So I got Gene McKinney to uh, come and hang with him. And got a call that morning, that night at two o'clock, that Hugh had been shot, and uh, and the police had been killed. Big had been killed. Yeah, and it was there after that the Free Hugh movement started. Yeah, yeah, it was after that the Free Hugh in the first place we had, but then we, you know, that's when that whole Free Hugh movement began the phase. But prior to that, going at, uh, just prior to him, before he was October of that year, they had, we were working on the paper. Bobby Seale and Elgin had been discussing about shortening the name to the Black Panther Party because it started the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And Huey ha was doing something that day and when they would get over there. It just so happened that he came later and they talked to him about it. And he said, no, no, no. He was a totally against it because he said it was too soon. You know, we just still left an organization, still patrolling in the community only about four or five, six months. But he, he said it was too soon. Well, they put it on the burner. But then that's when, after that, when they would get back to it, then you got, you got uh, shot, and the pig got killed, and the other one got wounded. It was thereafter then that Hugh, Eldridge, and Bobby them got together. And they changed the name to the Black Panther Party, shortly to the Black Panther Party. We mm -hmm. always find ourselves having to explain that self-defense part because people forget yeah. on yeah, how- Yeah, it, yeah, and that was about point number seven. They, they read, and that we uh, starting around point number seven, we wanted to end the police brutality and murder black folks because of urgency in the country at that time. And so you could have been about any other 10 point platform programs but that was the, the, the an urgency at that time. That's why I started around point number ten. Yeah, I mean point number seven. Yeah. So um, so is Sam Napier on the scene yet, or? Well, so I, I, I met Sam for everybody. I remember I used to go. I met Sam. We used to go to uh, it was a chicken place. It used to be on uh, an Asian Chinese used to cook these these uh, these these fish sandwiches. And Sam was then with these socialists, and, and they had when, ones who were calling us revisionists and reactionaries at the time. <laughs> we used to run away from the Parana. <laughs> and Sam was hanging with them. And we, I'd go to Wayne, he'd be there, and we'd come up and he'd call you revisionists and who, <laughs> you know. Then all of a sudden, then Sam came to the rallies, heard Bobby and he went, next day Sam joined the party. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. And so when he joined the party, they realized that there were brothers in the party that were kind of older and set in their ways and maybe wasn't going to take orders from the other young folks. You know, hard for some of them to do that. And so they gave Sam, Sam the position that they observed to see him as the newspaper dis distribution manager. And Sam had the green light to travel all over the country. And everywhere he go, he organized a crew. And he called back selling, he's selling papers. Yeah, he was a great organizer. When I first started doing artwork, they would check it, just make sure that it reflected the politics. Once I had they understood that I understood how, and through the artwork to interpret that in the, in the artwork, I was given the green light to create whatever I chose to create. And maybe maybe on four or five occasions, they may have said Pacific illustration or something like that. But uh, I think what year of the Panther was, was that was going to be the title of the paper. 
And so I did the illustration to reflect that because of the year of the Panthers. And so that's why, you know, and it's a reinterpretation of another image I had done like that before, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're still in the self-defense, mind you. And this is a psychological, and this is a part of psychological warfare in the artwork as well. Because as you know, as a party of all people to say they could tell how the party was going by looking at the artwork. So if we began to get into the social programs somewhat later on, even though we did still have showing the self-defense in the images, because we were getting more involved in a broader scope and points of views in the community and what have you. And so we began to implement those into the program. But a lot of it also happened too in the context of uh, taking the purely militaristic perspective and getting away from that and getting into the social program. That the people and the meeting needs of the people, you see. Yeah. Because at one point he was saying that when we all, you know, even we sent a letter, he was always engaged because tapes was being sent to him while he was incarcerated. Questions were being asked. You had legal advisors and stuff. Oh, uh, meeting him and what happened. So he was always, um, always engaged on what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to some degree, from he, what he could be, and being being locked up. Yeah, yeah. The Black Panther Party's ten point platform and program, and the rules of the party were in every single issue, right? And well, in the early issues, yes. Uh, yeah, early, yeah. Because oh. we started off reading the Red Book. They used to sell a Miles Red Book. We used to sell a Miles Red Book because you and them got the students at UC Berkeley used to write that book. And they used to buy, sell those books to get technical equipment and try to, for, for what they need, for what was needed for. And so it had universal principles in it. Colossal events. The first one was Sacramento. We went to Sacramento to observe the legislation that, was, that had got this right wing assemblyman. Mulford to begin to change the local gun ordinance. That was in 19, that was 19, that was on May Day, May 1st, 1967, on a Monday, which was May 2nd. And it was going there to observe the lesson, but it had been discussed between other you and Bobby, I'm quite sure El just but they were picking his brain at that time. This was still early phase. Uh, and so it was said, so um, we met at eight o'clock that morning over in Oakland, California. It was not just the Panthers who went, but you had the dead Dow family, the brother who was murdered in North Richmond, who took up his case, who was, who was uh, who, a, a brother who named Mark Comfort, who had been in the civil rights movement in the South, who had been in Lyons County, New York Lyons County Freedom Organization and the Panthers there, when it started simple there who was also organized in the open. He had a group of his boys that he was organized in, 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 in uh, East Oakland who went. You had the Dow family, him, his, a couple of his brothers and sisters also were part of the delegation who were there and the Panthers. And Artie Sia, Bobby's first wife, was a part of that delegation. But you never All seen right. to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you never see him in the family. Yeah. And so what, what happened? What did Jay say? What did Jay say? <laughs> he said, Artie. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then what happened is after it was explained uh, why we were going. We we're not going to get no gunplay. We we're going there to observe the legislation and what have you. And they had executive mandate number one that was supposed to be read when we got on the Capitol. And I was about the prison camps USA and that they were developing for black and brown people in this country and whatever, in essence. And so when we put your guns in the trunk, we take them out when we get to the Capitol. When we get to the Capitol, you take the gun and go, and we walk on the lawn. It just so happens that Ronald Reagan was then this, was the uh, governor of the state of California, was standing about 10 feet away holding a press conference. <laughs> And all the press was there. You've seen us, and then all the press gravitate to all the Nobody's supposed to talk but Bobby. He was the one that explained. And he explained that he, why Bobby was going to lead the delegation, why Huey was going to stay behind because they felt it was going to be a, a classroom event, and that the press would come and that they need somebody to talk with the press because you're still in the infant stages of the Black Panther Party. You see, so they understand the whole vision. 
Mm. And so, so when the press gravitates over to Bobby, Bobby reads the executive mandate number one, and he explains why we're there and what we're going, and what we're here for, to observe that. Then we they escort us into the building. The press leading the way because they want to go on and get their, I guess, get their story. And so we finally find us up on the second floor where the chambers where they were debating and discussing about these laws they were going to look all argue. When we get up there, the first one's going is the press. Right following is Panthers. First thing they say, get the press out of here. Mm. Right after that, they see the guns, they say, get the guns out of here. And we turn, everybody turn to leave. We go to out on the Capitol Island. Stayed there for about 10, 15 minutes. We left getting cars, go to a filling station about three or four blocks away. And this motorcycle cop comes by while we're taking the guns and putting them into the trunks. And he said, all these black folk with this gun, he gets on the road. Next thing you know, they come and swoon from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they come. <laughs> they take the guns, they, they make them and jam them up, make them in violation of the local gun artists. And everything, yeah. You know. I submit to you, it's preposterous. And in, in this urban society that we have in California, when we're fishing through the fish and game code and looking at municipal fire ordinances to try and prevent people from carrying weapons around in, in, uh, in, an, in an excited and hostile atmosphere. That scene over there yesterday, there were Cub Scouts milling around, there were children up the picnic with the governor. When this group met Saturday in Richmond, we took aerial shots of them from a helicopter in the meeting. Us. They sealed off a block in Richmond with armed guards at, at each corner and with riflemen on the roof. In the midst of this meeting, and the pictures show it, there were children out in bicycles playing. You know, and I'm, I think we've too long we've listened to these people who are afraid of some kind of bureaucratic takeover of arms. We've got to emphasize again that no one wants to touch the legitimate hunter. But we've got to protect society from nuts with guns. Yeah, the rest of the uh, yeah. And then we said, we were going back and forth. You had people calling saying they were passes. And they want to start a process, and they some up, and they want to start a chapter, and all these things. And so uh, it came to a point, and they didn't know all who had guns. Everybody had them, but they didn't know all who had them. They, they knew had Bobby had gun, little Bobby, I think a few others. But they wanted to, <clears throat> but they didn't have no case because it wasn't in violation of any laws. So, but they wanted to make a deal, and the deal was that we would have. Unsupervised probation if we plead guilty to the misdemeanor. Huh. And it was, and that means you wouldn't have to go to court. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to, you just do, you'd be six months. And, it, you know, that was just it. Well, for whatever long the time it would be. And Hill and Bobby discussed it and said, that's what we should do because you got all these people coming to call about wanting to know about the Panthers and all of it. We got to get, start getting the paper out. We got to do all this kind of stuff. And so it said that we, and they said that they wanted seven to 11 people, but they didn't know who all. They knew Bobby and they knew Bobby Hunt. And Bobby told, came to us together and said that he, that's what, what it was, that he chose those who were going to plead. And he wanted me to be one of those who plead to the charges. So we pleaded after we had been in jail, maybe a couple of weeks, two weeks prior to that, and then going back and forth to Sacramento going to court and what have you. So we go into the courtroom and we plead not get judge how we plead. We said guilty. And we turn around and walk out. And the judge said, no, no, y'all going to jail. So he tell us up. He said us up. That's guilty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so how long did y'all stay locked up? Well, we did different. I think I did about three, two or three weeks or more. And then you had a little Bobby Hutton who was a juvenile. Juvenile do, for misdemeanors, you go juvenile, you, you do a long time. Oh. As opposed to an adult. So he built a Bobby was in about three to six months. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had uh, Bobby C. I think it was in there for about a month or so. Yeah. The other Pat Comrades, two or three weeks or more. Yeah. It's the art that was a reflection of the, the people's and their aspirations, desires, and concerns, how they felt about uh, quality of life issues and change. 
So it was it was separate from that. It was interconnected because you have rallies. You you, you know you, you have free breakfast programs. You had free food giveaways, and you know people talking about these issues and concerns. You know, we just put them in a concentrated conform. You know, and where it became uh, and then you point out the contradictions of what the government should be doing and wasn't doing. So you heighten the contradictions at the same time. Yeah. That's why you had the treasurer of the state of California, which was then the most powerful position in the state above the governor, who said his name was, uh, I forgot his name, but I think it was, he said that the United, Black Panther Party was feeding more hungry children than the United States government. And they played that all over the news all day long. Mm -hmm. The papers were so impactful you had a, we say you had 100, 200,000 readership, but it was scientifically proven that there were four people read, four people read each paper. So we had a readership of about 400,000. 400, the paper was going from every, every little revelation moving around the country, around mm -hmm. the world. You had those brothers and sisters who were draft resistors in Canada and in Scandinavia. They were selling papers. Bobby Seale and Bill Bickman how, and others maybe went over there and, and organized with them. You see, so the paper was inspirational. That's how you had the uh, Polynesian Panthers, who became a chapter in 1971. You had the Australian inspired by the Panthers. It's Australia, called Australia Panthers. Then you had the London Panthers. Then you had the Dalit Panthers and all those inspired in India. That's the paper, the link, the contextion. It was our lifeline. That's why they started trying to destroy the papers. And I think one time we had them, was it, like Shelley said in one interview, they were pretty in Chicago at one point. When they got from point A to point B, they would be wet and all damped up until we had got our lawyers. As we evolved, at first we didn't have no chapters and branches. My, yeah. I was a paper seller because I used to hang out all over Fillmore and Hollis Point. Everyone in Fillmore, I knew people all over. And so I used to be the, selling the papers. Then, uh, then when we eventually got our distribution office in San Francisco, that, that our office in San Francisco came out of central distribution. And that's why our paper went out from there, was shipped out. But, but how, how? Truck, oh, we, plane? We, oh yeah, plane, yeah. We had comrades, sisters and brothers, 15, 16 years old, came in, was ready to put that paper together. Everybody had a responsibility, labeling them, typing the labels. Uh, organize them in uh, groups of where they were going to be going. And after that, we load them up to the truck and send, get them to the airport. And they'd be packed and ready to go, yeah, to those different locations. And then yeah. the party in Des Moines. Yeah, if they had X amount of papers for Chicago, they would be sent to Chicago. The X amount of papers for New York, they would be there. They know when they're coming in, they knew the plane. Okay. They knew when to be there, yeah. That was the that was the significance of, of Sam Napier. Yes. You know, because Emory mentioned earlier how instrumental, you know, he was. And mm -hmm. he developed cadres. That's right. You know, <laughs> all over the world. You yeah. know. And yeah. they were organized in a way where all Sam had to do, we didn't have no cell phones, but Sam had a way. Mm -hmm. Uh, uncanny, but he had a way of making sure that everything was everything where everything was supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. you know, yeah. he was the mm -hmm. essence of, of us getting, yeah. you know, uh, the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he was here all the time. He was just one yeah. of my favorite, favorite, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. comrade brothers of all time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he he, he got yeah. it out. You know? Yeah, yeah. He got it out, you yeah. know. And when you say he was here all the time, you mean that at the Illinois chapter and in, in head? Well, you know, Sam, Sam traveled. Yeah. You know, he would visit, you know, different chapters and branches and stay a little while. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <and> Sam. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, do some political education. And, yeah, yeah. You know, he was just a gregarious, mm -hmm. earthy, lovable mm -hmm. person. You know, yeah. if you didn't love Sam, Nick Pierre, it was impossible for you to love your mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, was there any closure to what happened to Sam? Well, well yeah, well, well, as you know, you, uh, it was coin toil pro, exploring our limitations and played us against each other in that context. It, you know, it may be somebody who, in, when the factionism came down, but we know that the corn tail pro was the cause of that situation, you know, yeah. Because Robert Webb, the other brother who got killed, Sam Napier, he was real close. Sam Napier mentored him. When he was, that's how he came to the party. Out from Hunters Point with Sam Napier. Yeah. That was with, yeah, yeah. We was with Webb, we was with Webb up mm -hmm. in uh, Philly. Mm -hmm. You know, about the mm -hmm. uh, Constitutional Convention, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah that was, it was called Tell Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, you know, uh, and that's one of the things that I talk to people about who think they want to organize. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called having the ability to vet, mm -hmm. which we didn't have at that time. No, no. Now, you can bet anybody, you know, mm -hmm. by way of social media, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we went on the strip of someone's word mm -hmm. and tried to watch the, you know, social interaction, their social practice. And sometimes you got fooled, mm -hmm. you know, because the government was very slick, you know, in terms of... Uh, psychologically profiling yeah i know they they psychologically profiled me a lot mm -hmm. but they was always wrong <laughs> <laughs> they never got me you know yeah you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. but you know we we just have to pass this down to yeah. to young people you know we say 1969 you know, the year of the Panther, we also said you make the revolution. Mm -hmm. You know, so That's the right. critical piece of, of what it is that, you know, we want to portray is, mm -hmm. is the need for young folk to, to become critical right. uh, uh, thinkers and, and, and analytic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and their approach to, to processing mm -hmm. uh, social justice issues and concerns. Mm -hmm. and, and and know that the minute you step out there against the oppressor, mm -hmm. you got five, six, seven, eight, and nine folk coming at you at all times. That's mm -hmm. a fact, you mm -hmm. know. So you just need to be on point. Like Malcolm said, when he would when he would introduce, he said he talked. He said, "Brothers, sisters, and enemies." <laughs> you know. So he was trying to educate, enlighten, inform everybody. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's what the Black Panther Party was about in that context, you know? Uh, so, but we also have ways of observing, maybe checking our stuff and trying to make, make sure that we uh, uh, was aware of what was going on and who, who folks were and, and the best we could as young people. You know what I'm saying? This is, you, this is on the job training. Hmm. We ain't had 50 years. We don't know how we go along. When you talk about youth movement, this was a youth movement. When it started off, absolutely, yeah, and there was urgency yeah, to it, yeah. I mean, this thing come about came to be seven days a week, twenty four hours a day, three hundred sixty five days a year. We was working the shifts, yeah. This is the shifts, yeah. And when we put out the call, I tell you, how, when we put out the call, Bobby Seale did a rally in San Francisco. And he said, well, we got these forms we here. We want people with these skills to come and fill them up after the rally and give them to Brother Emery. And then we give us and then we'll, if, we'll tell me what your skills you got. And so he gave me those. Then uh, a brother said, well, look, you called me. Uh, let me know. I'm a, I got, you know, I can help you do the pre-production for the paper, do the films and stuff like that. And this brother was sharp. He's middle class brother. And we used to go up. And every, every, uh, when, when we did need uh, help, I recall telling Bobby and them, and I gave him a call. He was running a print shop in the financial district mm. of San Francisco. And we used to go upstairs, and we used to, uh, he would print the, the photographs and stuff we needed for the paper. That was DC. 
That became brother named Don Cox, who became a field marshal for the Black Panther Party. He was working for Cord in. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was a shout middle class brother. <laughs> yeah. Ser serious brother, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had an opportunity to meet DC. Uh, yeah, there's pictures of him, Fred, and all of them. My side, they had an incident mm -hmm. on one of uh, airplanes. And uh, prior to that, we were just moving around doing this and doing that. And we weren't actually recognized. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the ideological, philosophical, political understanding that was manifested in the Black Panther Party, in particular, the understanding of the uh, 10 point platform you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that go DC and my side. Okay. And yeah. Chairman Fred and uh, mm -hmm. Bobby Rush and, and uh, Chairman. But anyway, you know, uh, we, we were able to develop the understanding and uh, DC was instrumental in that, you know, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my side too. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, you know, that yeah. was. That so I'll was just read beginning. this to the audience. To the left, we have Bobby Seal, Chairman Bobby Seal, mm -hmm. Illinois Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton. This is. Mm -hmm. So DC Cox, what was his um, field marshal? Field marshal. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Field Marshal D.C. Cox and um, Central Committee Ray Masai Hewitt. Yeah, right? Masai Hewitt was a Marxist when he joined the party. He uh -huh. became a political, ed political education uh, teacher as well in the party. Okay, he was he was a master in martial arts as well. And then uh, the Deputy Minister of Defense for the Illinois Chapter, Bobby Rush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting rejuvenated listening yeah. to Emory saying all the things <laughs> that I know to be true that I consistently share with you. Mm -hmm. And it's just refreshing, you know. So I ain't got nothing he, mm -hmm. he can speak. I know you said you had Geronimo Jajaga's uh, uh, family member, one of his cousins yeah, online. He, he's on, yeah, he's working. Yeah, well, 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 I want to tell the story of when I first met Geronimo. That was when uh, he was real close with Bunchy. And uh, oh, before yeah. anybody, he was, before he was, everybody knew him, he had came up. Then they asked everybody to come up from L.A. And I had seen him that day, and they cut it up. This was early on. And we had a path to party that, that night. And I was walking up the hill to the party, and he was leaving. And he had a bag in his hand. It looked like he had a pie in the bag. And I stopped him. I said, hey, brother, how you doing? He looked. <laughs> he said, and I said, and I revolved, first remember that we're seeing that day. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he always reminded me when I was going to see him and, and when he was locked up, he said, boy, you came close. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to shoot you. He said, I had a, my, my technical equipment in that bag. <laughs> Bunchy was in prison with Eldridge. Bunchy used to come up to see Eldridge when he first got out of prison. And El, this is when we still had the, the skeleton screw working on the paper. And he would tell me not to mention anything about Bunchy coming up because they were both on parole. And if it got out there on a broad scale, they could be violating their parole. But then eventually, Bunchy came up one time and he took him over to visit Huey when he was in prison and locked up in, uh, in the county jail and opened. After he came back, that's when he said, hey, I'm ready. And that's when he took over the chapter in L.A. There was another brother who named who ran that chapter, but couldn't get it off the ground. But Bunch is the one who was responsible for the growth and the development of, of the uh, LA chapter of, of the Black Panther Party. And John, John Huggins was Erica Huggins' uh, husband. Okay. And they had the, and they came out from back east. Cointel Pro. You remember Cointel Pro? Yeah. 